Hello everyone, my name is Deborah Charles and I'm the Senior Managing Editor here at DevEx. Thank you very much for joining us today to talk about how new technologies, including satellite data and remote sensing, can play an important role in protecting and conserving nature. This is the third and final event of a series that DevEx has produced in partnership with the satellite applications Catapult. Last year at COP26 in Glasgow, the world's leading multilateral development banks issued a joint statement emphasizing the critical role that nature plays in providing re resources and services that human health and well being depend on, as well as supporting jobs, economic growth, and food security. And last month, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued a dire warning about the consequences of inaction to counter human induced climate change and said that safeguarding and strengthening nature is key to securing a livable future. New technologies could be a game changer for global efforts to conserve and protect nature. There are some fascinating tools that we'll talk about today that have great potential for impact, but not if they remain inaccessible to the people on the front lines of conservation efforts. Surveys have shown that many frontline front workers cite technical barriers as a major constraint to adopting new technologies. So today we're bringing together some great experts to take a closer look at the role technologies can play in protecting and conserving nature. We'll talk about what can be done to address current barriers, particularly in remote or harder to reach areas by sharing lessons learned by innovative conservation projects. This event is broken down into three segments. First, we'll have a discussion on how to create and use meaningful tools. Then we'll be interviewing the Chief Climate Officer at the US Agency for International Development. And finally, we'll pull it all together with a panel of experts with hands-on experience to talk about how best to use tech and get it to frontline workers to preserve and conserve nature. So let's jump in with our first chat. I'm delighted to welcome to our virtual fireside chat, Dan Wicks, the Head of Geospatial Intelligence at the Satellite Applications Catapult and Stephanie O'Donnell, Program Lead at Wild Labs, a conservation technology community. Welcome both. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's great to have you guys. So Dan, I mentioned that joint statement at COP where the, the multilateral development banks committed to using tools and technologies to support decision-making around protecting nature. What, what types of tools might they, might support this commitment? And, and what kind of advantage would they offer? Yeah, it's a great question. I think one of the challenges we have is the, the range and diversity of these, you know, these tools and technologies, how to navigate them, how to know what's useful and what's useless. Um, and I, but I think, you know, br br broadly, you can think about them cutting across a sort of spectrum of data collection all the way through to sort of processing that data to get the useful information out of it through to how does a user really interface with that 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 information in a in a meaningful way so at the sort of data collection end of the spectrum there's some really interesting stuff going on from space obviously earth observation satellites and the range of information they can collect but more broadly than that um we've got uh, on the ground sensors uh, which are you know cheaper to manufacture than ever before and easily deployed. You've got DNA technologies for kind of analyzing different ecosystem species as as well as well as other sorts of remote sensing technologies like like drones, for example. And then how do you bring all of that together? Well, um, uh, you know the cloud is playing an increasingly important role in that, and you you layer in technologies like like ai and you're able to to pull insights like like never before um and then i suppose finally you know how does somebody interface with this with this stuff well therein lies one of the biggest the biggest challenges is ensuring that um you know content is curated in a way that is driven directly towards a user's kind of need and 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 requirement and there's a host of there's a host of technologies out there which i'm sure we'll we'll talk more about through this conversation I think that paints a very idealized picture of what's what's available right now. I think from uh, I think a, a best case scenario, a lot of the the 
sorry, what you've said about um, the availability of sensors and low costs on the ground um, hardware for, for collecting data is absolutely true, but we've got such a big gap in terms of actually making AI and all of the analytics um, user friendly and usable and, and reliable. I think there's, it, it's, it feels a little bit more aspirational than practical right now, but definitely will be what what will be useful in coming years and, and where a lot of the energy and um, innovation is happening at the moment. But yeah, I think it's it, just adding like the conservation perspective of like actually as a, an end user, what's available, like at the high end, um, if you've got lots of, of uh, you've got big budgets and, and a lot of technical expertise, maybe um, the analytics are there, but that there are big gaps still when, when you're talking about everyday users. Yeah, I I think that's a, sorry, go ahead. I think you're no, answering exactly yeah, I think, what I, I think that's asked. a fair comment. I think, um, you know, there's two points there. One is, you know, how do you make those those tools more accessible generally? Yeah. And, you know, there are efforts. There are efforts in that regard. So increasingly, you know, I don't have to be a, a machine learning expert coming from a math background to be able to use those yeah. sorts of data science approaches. You know, there are lots of open source tool sets that allow me to access that at a much in a much easier e easier easier way so 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 there is some work going on to, to sort of help help there but but there's probably a more important point in terms of actually how do you ensure sort of interdisciplinary working where you bring that you know data science into the realm of conservation so that you get a co-design approach and for me that's one of the big kind of challenges also, yeah, I totally agree with that. It's also the most exciting like possibilities at the moment because I think conservationists are very used to, yeah, I'm just going to learn how to do everything myself and like just find a way because I don't have budget or like I've just got to do it. And the, the challenges we face are so urgent that it's it's really like I think we just have a really scrappy I'll do it myself sort of mindset. And it's like the challenges that we're facing as a as a globe are so complex and so urgent that conservationists cannot do it alone we can't learn how to do all of these things by ourselves so uh the the opportunities for collaborating with other sectors and building the team of people who are who are tackling climate change and biodiversity challenges and everything that we've been like um uh looking at and and trying to solve for the last however many decades can't do it alone like having building pathways for for engineers and developers and ml experts to come and bring their skills and collaborate with with the conservation and biodiversity experts is so exciting and um the only way forward right um yeah and i think uh, i mean a learning from from look, first of all not everyone doing the same thing and reinventing the wheel each time is probably really important too. So maybe Please. if we take take um, a step back because it, Wild Labs has this really interesting, fascinating report in my mind, this State of Conservation's Technology Report um, that seems to be the first effort of its kind to, to take a bigger picture view of what the field is. And then maybe with that, uh, the goal is to try and, and do something in a collaborative nature, um, I guess, what would you, Stephanie, what were some of the most surprising findings in that out of that report? Uh, yeah, we it, the our state of conservation tech research came out of um, we a, a lot of there has been a lot of work by individual experts and teams of experts to try and come together with like five, ten people and identify where the challenges and opportunities lie. But our work like at Wild Labs, our, our goal is to build the conservation technology global community. We have 6,000 conservation technologists around the world. And um, we survey them every year to find out like, okay, what, what programs we need to build to serve you, to support collaboration, to support innovation. And we kept thinking that, you know, we have this data, could we take a step back and do a formal assessment that no one's had access to and, and give voice to give the community a voice and uh, um, with some academic rigor behind it to identify as a as a um, as a community, what the opportunities are, what the immediate challenges are, and then on a further time scale, where could we go in five, ten years, and how do we get there, and what systemic changes need to be made? And so you asked about what were the surprising things, and actually, 
I think uh, the most surprising thing was how consistently our experts and our community identified the same challenges and opportunities. Like, so as part of this research, we held um, seven focus groups with 50 different experts on, uh, on um, uh, seven different areas of, of technology. And the, the same things came up in every single, um, every single uh, discussion. And all the experts were like, we thought they'd talk about these short term challenges like battery life or how big, like how long um, a biologa can last or, or um, issues of like specific issues around machine learning. But they all gravitated to these big picture systemic um, discussions about, you know, how do we support data sharing? How do we um, build collaborations? How do we change our funding? Um, changing our funding mechanisms and and um lower the costs and and all of these um uh, capacity building and systemic barriers and and opportunities that um that emerge in, in our field and so for me the i, I know you expected a, an answer like oh my goodness machine learning is going to be amazing or edna is going to be transformative and it's actually not the case like because we are looking at this whole sector as a as a um, as a whole, um, the the really surprising thing for me was how consistently there is agreement about what's needed, and that is um, lowering the costs, lowering the barriers, increasing um, investment in capacity building, and um, uh, supporting collaboration. And this there's also just a feel of optimism as well which i don't think you get very often in our in our work because things are dire um but an optimism about and it's partly because it, it was our community as well but um uh, an optimism about where we could be going if we can collaborate and 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 the even just the um the willingness and interest from the tech sector and other sectors like the the space sector in um the, being involved in, and um, using skills and resource and and um, energy to tackle conservation and, and biodiversity challenges was seen as just such a, a an opportunity and, and a reason for optimism in, in our world. And Dan, what and that sort of leads it perfectly to you. I mean, first of all, I guess do you, your reaction to that, but also what sort of things is are, is Catapult doing that would sort of help conservationists and sort of thinking of, of what Stephanie said? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great articulation of the, the problem space and something that we recognize really strongly. So the way that we think about it is how do you how do you bring these kind of communities together in the right way to do something, you know, something meaningful? Mm. We're very, you know, we're very driven by ensuring that everything we do comes from uh, the perspective of the user or the challenge space and is not a technology, you know, technology driven driven thing so we're very conscious of that and you know that's why our collaboration with with wild labs and others is so so crucial but you know if i if i what does that mean in, in reality you know i think about the interesting challenges of things like you've got a an academic that's been sat in a university for 40 years in a zoology department who has thousands if not millions of data points you know yeah. in a in a file cabinet somewhere you know, how do you tap into that in the context of some of, you know, the, the the emerging technologies? Like, what if you put that in the context of satellite imagery? Or what if you brought some AI to bear in that? And then what if you did that alongside everybody else's, you know, in, in, information? There's something really powerful, I think, that can that can come from that. But there's a real sort of enablement of behavioral change and, you know, tra transition towards more collaborative working that's that's instrumental. And is Catapult, does Catapult have certain sort of, pro I know you're working in collaboration with Wild Labs and other sorts of, like, are you already moving towards that? Yeah, uh, we, you know, we try, we, we try to work in that way in, in many of the projects that, 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 that we run and, you know, putting together those collaborations is a big part of what we do, but a big part of what we do as well is just edu trying to educate communities as to the value add that certain technologies can can provide to then facilitate those those you know collaborations and the catapult is an you know acts as an interesting neutral actor in the market where because we're not trying to sell anything to anybody you know people will listen to what we have to say which is mm. which is great 
that's why we've we've ended up i think that's why our collaboration has worked so well like we've hugely valued working with the satellite catapult and just uh, what we've learned from your teams about user-centered design and and how that's helped us build programs and shape programs has just been so beneficial for 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 our work and i think um wild lab similarly is technology agnostic like we're not like we're not about shiny things and like the the sexy new new technologies and just dropping things in we're, we're about boring technologies and having impact and being led by the conservation challenge and i'll, I'll say that like one of the biggest um that one of the things that the satellite catapult's been helping us build is um programs to match make and support these collaborations between finding a conservationist who has a challenge and matchmaking them with a eo or a space um company to have a fellowship and and um, collaborate on specific projects together and we're also building um together we've been building um something called an inventory um which is supposed to it's a big database of all of the data sets and technologies and projects and and um, organizations that are working in the conservation tech sector and trying to make it more like you mentioned at the start of this chat like the idea of like trying to stop reinventing the wheel and part of that is just understanding who's doing what and um it's just such a basic step but um i think with like conservation and the conservation tech sector particularly there's so much low-hanging fruit and this is one of them just trying to make it visible what data exists and from there we can build these collaborations where that academic who's been sitting in the zoology department can share their data and like find someone I contacted by three people this week looking for data for ml models about like animal behavior so and there's i think there's a lot of willingness to to share and particularly when you're working on challenges that we every partner can understand that they have such real world and important impacts if we can if we can address them so i think there's just so much opportunity in 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 our space and um actors like the satellite catapult and and, and like wild labs who are, are neutral but here to convene and help collaboration and help like we succeed when all of our community succeeds which is such a wonderful place to be in because you don't um you can just support and create spaces that bring together different experts and, and can move us to address these systemic challenges. Um, this is such a great conversation. I can't believe we're almost out of time. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly throw to each of you just sort of what what sort of action could we take um, right now or where are the opportunities to sort of move forward? Can If you can synthesize it in, say, 15 seconds. I'll go for Dan first. OK. Um, I mean, I think I'm, I'm just going to be repeating points that we've already made, but it's sort of in, interdi interdisciplinary ways of working is is sort of vital, um, getting that cross science working. And part of that as well is bringing the right skills in, in terms of succession planning. So, for example, um, working in the space sector, people will have a certain view of what that is. But what that actually is, is doing conservation, uh, if you see what I mean. Um, and I suppose the other point would be uh, tr trying to leverage, um, uh, you know, a lot of pre-existing technologies better rather than chasing the newest, you know, greatest thing. The, the, the best analogy I would give is, you know, smart cities is a, is a good example of, of an area of huge technology development. But that you can't roll out smart city solutions unless you've got basic connectivity in a city, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, very true. Stephanie, in I was just quick. I mean, I agree with all of what Dan has said, so I'll give him uh, the credit for wrapping up the systemic big picture. I think what I'll, I'll end on is if you're listening to this and you're in the technology or space or, or a non-conservation sector and you're interested, I think my call to action is that we want to work with you and I think there's a lot of um, a lot of need and a lot of really interesting projects and um, ways that you can use your skills to help um, with conservation and help with biodiversity and climate change if you're interested. So I think uh, come and um, uh, if you're interested, come and find a way to to get involved. And Wild Labs is just one of the avenues that you can can use to to um, to discover um, projects and people that could use your help. So um, yeah, we need your help. So yeah, so much there. 
the collaboration, I think, is such a key and so important of a message that you guys have both given today. Um, well, we are unfortunately out of time. So thank you both to thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Dan, for joining us today. Um, I know I learned a lot and it was you're right. I was surprised at your response. So um, we have still more discussion on to continue. So stay tuned for an interview right now with uh, USAID's chief climate officer. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this conversation. My name is Michael Igo. I'm a senior reporter with DevEx, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by Gillian Caldwell, who's USAID's chief climate officer. Um, in that role, she serves as a deputy assistant administrator overseeing the energy, environment, and infrastructure teams at the agency. And she's responsible for coordinating USAID's climate and environment work broadly across the entire agency. Gillian, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Michael. So we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to jump right into it. Um, you know, I think the the big news from where you sit, um, well, there's probably a lot of big news, but one big item is that you are developing this new climate change strategy for USAID. I know you released it for public consultation in November and, and received a lot of feedback. I wonder if you could just give us sort of the, the quick elevator pitch for what a new strategy will enable the agency to do on climate, but in particular, how you envision it might sort of shape um, how USAID engages in partnerships, specifically, you know, in the context of this conversation related to technology and innovation. Yeah, absolutely. So as you've mentioned, USAID is just in the midst of finalizing its climate strategy. Um, we expect to be launching it next month in April 2022, and it will take us through 2030. And there are six kind of high level outcomes we're seeking to achieve with this strategy, which is really going to be a, sort of an unprecedented whole of agency response to the climate crisis. Um, the headline is that we want to mitigate 6 billion tons of carbon equivalent by 2030. That's about the entire US emissions in any given year. Um, as a key part of that carbon mitigation uh, target, we want to preserve 100 million hectares of critical landscapes. We want to, on the uh, resilience and adaptation front, support 500 million people worldwide to become better prepared for climate impacts. We also want to mobilize $150 billion in public and private finance because we know from the IPCC that we're going to need up to $5 trillion per year on climate mitigation and adaptation by 2030, which is you know, a 590% increase uh, from where we are now. Um, also, uh, and I think quite importantly, we're going to be aligning the work that we do with our missions. We have missions in 80 countries worldwide and a presence in 100. We're going to be supporting our host countries to deliver on their commitments under the Paris Agreement. So those are the so-called NDCs, Nationally Determined Contributions, and their NAPs, their National Adaptation Plans. We'll be providing technical and financial support alongside a very broad range of bilateral allies and donors to move beyond talk to action, um, which, of course, was a central mantra for the critics of um, the COP in Glasgow. And throughout all of this, evidence uh, is uh, technology and innovation are going to be really critical. Um, there, uh, you know, those three elements, evidence, technology, and innovation are one of five foundational principles for our strategy. Another one is, of course, equity. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to be looking very closely at how technology can help advance our efforts to drive an impact on the climate crisis. Yeah, thank you. I mean, those sound like incredibly ambitious goals and also um, really clear and concrete goals um, with a lot of big numbers attached to them. Is USAID sort of currently equipped to um, to determine, you know, if the countries that you're working with are are achieving those, whether they're targets in the nationally determined contributions or um, or targets set in collaboration with USAID? I mean, is the measurement infrastructure kind of there, or is that something that really is going to require a lot of development inside of the agency and and with its partners? 
Well, I think we're going to place less emphasis on um, monitoring and evaluation when it comes to the specific NDCs and the NAPs. There are many others that will be engaged on that level. But, um, you know, when you think about monitoring and evaluation writ large and the role that um, technology can play in ensuring we maximize our impact, um, you know, there's there's quite a few uh, important examples of how we of how we do that um, in Malawi, for example, um, we're really helping the country Im improve their resilience to climate change because, of course, Africa's being hit first and worst when it comes to the climate impacts. Um, so we have geographers and data data analysts working to understand how livelihood vulnerability and population growth and climate change are. Um, are, are, are going to play out in the context of the impact so that the programming designed to respond to it can ensure it targets the people who are most vulnerable um, and that we really understand the factors driving that vulnerability, like access to land or the age of the household or literacy levels. Great. Correct me if my framing is wrong here, but the way I sort of understand it is that there are two overarching buckets. One is that USAID is going to be doing a lot more on climate change, sort of you know proactive, clearly defined climate change programming. But then the other is sort of incorporating um, climate change into you know the full breadth of the agency's programming and and looking at you know how climate change is a, a factor broadly that influences development and humanitarian relief. Um, can you just talk about sort of what that? Uh, integration process looks like? Um, and I don't know if there's sort of a, a technology angle here, but how are you sort of looking across the full breadth of USAID's programs to, um, to determine how climate fits in? Yeah. So Administrator Power has frequently referred to us as a climate agency of late. And um, I think what she means by that is that uh, the climate crisis is poised to completely disrupt any of the progress we've made so far addressing um, development needs globally, or if we play our cards right, hopefully to help turbocharge progress towards you know, a just and equitable future with, a, with an economy completely reinvented um, with you know, renewable energy at its source. So, um, all, all operating units across the agency, all the missions are really being asked to think about how the programming they're advancing can help us deliver stronger outcomes when it comes to climate. Um, to give you one example, um, we work a lot on land and resource governance. Um, and of course, this is relevant to climate change because if you have proper either formal or informal land titling, you're likely to have better stewardship of the land and stewardship of the land and especially the forest is critical to um, reducing uh, our carbon footprint. So um, one of the less sophisticated technologies that we deploy is MAST, the mobile approaches to secure tenure, which trains communities to use basic smartphones and tablets to affordably map and document their land and resources. So in a case like this, with just a little bit of training, community members can lead on doing, uh, you know, developing these low cost, these low cost maps themselves, and um, you know, increase the the strength of the stewardship they have over the land. An intervention like that also reduces the cost of land titles. Um, we did some analysis in Tanzania, and we know that it reduced the cost from forty dollars per parcel to under eight dollars per parcel. So that's a fivefold decrease in the in the expense. Um, uh, another example um, of the crossover in programming and how technology is connected would be in the areas of both our uh, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and our uh, Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. So. Both humanitarian and resistance and food security are obviously on high alert when it comes to climate change because of all of the disruptions we're seeing to global supply chains um, and to weather patterns. So we have a partnership with Severe, which is this longstanding uh, partnership with NASA 
where we're leveraging cutting edge technology and climate and weather data to improve planning and decision making in local communities. So using satellite data and geospatial technology, we can improve forecasting for disaster preparedness, which of course reduces the cost of responding to disasters, but also um, to help communities understand potential forthcoming food and water insecurity air quality challenges, changes you know, in land use. There's multiple applications of the severe of the severe technology. Um, and again, you know, we see cost savings. I mean, there's a pretty exciting example in Kenya of where Severe is working to build the resilience of women farmers through satellite-based agricultural microinsurance. So crop insurance is designed to better support small-scale agriculture by automatically paying out when growing conditions drop below a certain threshold. So we can use algorithms to understand factors like rainfall and temperature readily measured from space and ensure automated payments um, rather than requiring insurers to process claims individually, which reduces the cost of insurance and increases the pace at which women farmers in, in Kenya are, are paid um, per their insurance schemes uh, when, when their agricultural productivity is in decline. That's fantastic. I, you really sort of anticipated the, the last question that I, I had for you. I'm, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned some of the food security implications here. It's something that we're watching really closely, um, particularly you know in the fallout from the situation in Ukraine. Um, but what I was interested in, in asking you was sort of, you know, it seems to me in a lot of ways the addressing climate change is, is um, sort of a measurement challenge or a, a prioritization challenge. Um, and with something like climate change adaptation, you know, I think we've heard a lot of discussion of the ways that it's, it's difficult to measure because it's difficult to prove a negative. You know, if a community was, is more highly adapted to climate change and they don't experience a disaster, um, how do you know that, you know, that, uh, that you improve the situation if, if you don't have that sort of negative outcome to compare to? I guess I just wonder, um, how does USAID think about that, that measurement challenge? How are you um, measuring your impact on climate change adaptation in particular, um, but also in ways that allow you to sort of prioritize, you know, in this um, world of great uncertainty about what climate change sort of portends? Here are the the areas where we know we can have a high impact and, and here's how we're able to measure that. Yeah, I think it's a really good question because frankly, um, you know, the indicator that we have for adaptation and resilience, which is reaching a half a billion people is, is a quantitative metric that's it's pretty unsatisfying, really, when you think about it. Um, you know, what does it mean to have improved the resilience and adaptation of a given community? And in fact, at the US government wide level, we're having this conversation to proliferate the, the number and um, the importance of the indicators that we're using to evaluate our impact under PREPARE, which is the President's Emergency Preparative Initiative on Adaptation, where USAID is um, you know, a lead implementing partner. Um, you know, I mentioned many dimensions of vulnerability, which can be assessed, uh, you know, quantitatively and qualitatively, um, whether that's literacy levels or um, health indicators or access to land or agricultural productivity. I mean, there's many, many indicators that we can be using to assess the effectiveness of our interventions and to compare where people are today to where they are five or 10 years from now. But I think the trick is really going to be, is going to be deciding which indicators are, are most meaningful. Um, and you know, that may vary from place to place. I think overarchingly, when you think about technology, um, it's critically important, but it isn't a panacea. And what we find again and again is that if technology isn't locally appropriate and customized to the context, likewise monitoring and evaluation, um, it's not going to be as effective in driving outcomes. So um, I think the jury's still out on the range of measures that we'll be using in context specific areas to, to assess um, the impacts that we're having when it comes to uh, mitigation and adaptation. Great. Well, we're excited to continue following your efforts and the rollout of this new strategy. 
Um, Gillian, thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk us through these issues today. Really appreciate it. It's great to hear from you. Thanks so much for having me, Michael. Thanks for that really interesting interview, Michael. So far, we've had some great insight into what types of tools are out there, and Gillian Caldwell talked about how USAID has used technology in its programs. So next up, we have a panel of experts who work every day figuring out how to use tech to protect nature and conservation, and how to make sure that that tech is accessible to everyone. So a warm welcome to the virtual, on the virtual stage to Shashank Srinivasan, Director of Technology for Wildlife Foundation. Jessica Webb, a Senior Engagement Manager at Global Forest Watch, an initiative housed within the World Resources Institute. And David Williams, Senior Director of Conservation Geography at the African Wildlife Foundation. Welcome, everybody. So I think I'd, I'd like to start um, by throwing a question out to each of you, just to kind of set the stage. Um, and because you're on my screen first, I'll go with you, Shashank. How are your respective organizations using satellite data and technology to help protect vulnerable ecosystems and biodiversity? And if you wouldn't mind also saying, what are some of the barriers you see to sort of scaling that up and implementing those tools more widely? Thanks, Deborah. Uh, so yeah, as Deborah introduced me, I'm Shashank Srinivasan. I run Technology for Wildlife Foundation out of India. We're based in Goa on the western coast, but we work all across the country uh, with partners in almost every state in India at this point of time. We use satellites and drones to actually acquire imagery, which we can then analyze for conservation purposes. And um, yeah, we, we think that it's actually quite something, it's, it's something that is underexplored, um, especially in like uh, in, in our part of the world, where to actually use satellite imagery, not just to make maps, but to actually like get to a point where you're making serious conservation impact. Focused on our tagline is that we amplify conservation impact, and we find partners who aren't able to access the skill sets or the tools they need uh, to use the data out there, and actually help them access it and use it to the best possible, uh, you know, for the best possible outcomes. Thank you very much, um, Jessica. How about you? Thanks, everyone, and uh, happy to be here. Um, the Global Forest Watch, uh, as you mentioned, is an initiative within the World Resources Institute, and we make uh, satellite-based uh, data as well as other geospatially explicit data uh, available um, to help users around the world uh, monitor and uh, manage forests, uh, and uh, particularly deforestation. Um, and so we provide um, this data through uh, free and open source uh, tools um and uh that users can can access in order to uh, monitor global deforestation commitments uh reduce deforestation in uh, commodity supply chains uh, make land use uh, zoning decisions and inform uh, land use management um sound the alarm of deforestation uh, hotspots um, and their drivers and um, also to uh, do field patrols to um, respond to and halt uh, illegal deforestation. And, and what, well, I'm just a quick follow up before I jump to David, what are there certain barriers you see um, that you would like to just point out from the at the beginning for getting this out to getting everybody to be able to use this? Sure. I mean, certainly, um, with, you know, technology and um, the, all of the information that's that's now globally and freely available, um, like satellite imagery, um, certainly in order to be able to, to access this um, internet connectivity uh, is still an issue and, and while increasing, um, that's certainly still a limitation um, for a lot of folks around the world. Um, something that we, we hope to, to see continually improve, particularly for uh, communities or um, local law enforcement working in remote areas where deforestation happens, um, the internet connectivity is still a limitation. Um, but the biggest challenge has been um, not so much um, the access or use of the technology itself, but some of the governance issues um, surrounding what happens with that information. So we work with um, 
a lot of partners and users around the world who are doing all the right things. Um, they're identifying and documenting illegal deforestation uh, and then you know, submitting that information to authorities or even local law enforcement is collecting and documenting that information. But because of the limited resources that law enforcement has to respond, um, there's often a very long delay um, between you know, receiving the complaints about the illegal activity and, and actually something being done about it, if if ever. Um, so certainly those those governance challenges are are difficult. Thank you. Yeah, I can imagine the delays, which only get worse and worse as it goes along the chain. Um, David, how about you? Thank you. Um, it's great to be here with you all. Um, yeah, I work with the African Wildlife Foundation based out of Washington, D.C. AWF is a conservation NGO uh, focused on protecting Africa's wildlife and wildland uh, towards a, a sustainable development effort uh, in, across Africa. Um, um, much of our work focuses on the landscape scale where we uh, engage partners such as the protected area authorities, communities, private sector uh, to uh, support uh, conservation measures, recognizing that large uh, wide ranging uh, species such as the elephant uh, require lots of room to roam. Um, some of the technology we use uh, involves uh, remote sensing to characterize uh, land use land cover, which is a foundational data set for um, assessments of habitat. Uh, steps like land use conversion and degradation um, and is, uh, sets the stage for um, other modeling efforts uh, to understand issues, for example, uh, hotspots of um, threats and, and how they might intersect with uh, the wildlife areas. Um, and we, we're trying, a lot of what we find is uh, been fruitful is intersecting data from the field and sky, um, you know, using um, patrol based assessments of uh, to help capture a picture of where, where wildlife distributions are and threats that they face, uh, such as hunting camps and human wildlife conflict. Um, and, and then um, combining that with satellite images. Uh, characterizations uh, can, that those can be quite powerful. Thank you. This is an interesting like combination of of efforts being made, and it just shows how broad the issue is. I think um, if I go over back to Shashank, um, I was interested to see that you're also a robot operator, um, as well as a conservation geographer. So. I think you probably have a really good sense of looking at some of these innovative solutions out there. Like how, how can they actually play, a, how can these te satellite technologies and data, how can it play a, a really significant role in conservation efforts? Uh, so I'll talk about the spatial component with the satellites first, right? So again, I'm really glad like, that Jessica is on the call because again, I can actually tell someone from WDI that we're huge fans of Global Forest Watch, right? We use it a lot and we push lots of the partners we work with to just using global forest watch itself but i said that a lot of the limitations again like in terms of internet connectivity in terms of language in terms of accessibility are something that things you know we're, we're facing in like the developing world which is that okay you're at the we have lots of biodiversity there's a lot of like uh, there's a lot of like the different problems there's poverty there's you know like the pressure to actually move into protected areas and start uh, you know uh, like look, finding a more place for agriculture there's lots of pressure on the on, on habitat and again there's space for nature there's also space for people which are essential over here right so again from our perspective conservation is all about land use decisions and understanding how the land is used is critical for like sustainable conservation and sustainable conservation means you're going to be incorporating communities we completely opposed to like a fortress model of conservation in that context so like just okay what is the best way to have like land sharing land sparing you know what what actually works so all of that needs spatial data it needs local knowledge as well and again like web-based platforms are a great first step but the gap we are filling 
again like working here again we're a, we're a small team we work with lots of partners a lot of our work is giving people advice and just like helping them access the resources they want to um, but we also make a lot of maps so we go and pull out open source imagery a free imagery from again the, the landsat series i've been using landsat 7 since it was uh, you know made open and free from back in 2007 um, we use a lot of sentinel imagery as well we're currently using planet imagery via the the NICFI grant which is essentially the norwegian government government uh, giving planet um, money so that they can actually release some of their imagery for free to people who are working on tropical deforestation efforts, right? So we can actually go and get tiles from planet, from Sentinel, from Landsat, uh, use Global Forest Watch, other sources like Google Earth uh, Pro as well, look at what's happening on the land and then be like, okay, we want to know what's happening on this particular day, uh, you know, what happened on, for example, January 5th in the Western Ghats in India, which are the, in, like, you know, uh, one of the global biodiversity hotspots, it's like dense tropical forest okay so we want we, we, we've had some information from one of our partners that something's happened so can we actually go and get satellite imagery and corroborate that um going back going on to the robot operator component again when we started using drones back in 2015 again for someone who works with satellite imagery calculating overpass schedules calculating okay is it going to be cloud and especially again like in india we've got the monsoon so this satellite imagery uh optical imagery anyway not radar is is not really usable over the monsoon period uh, but now we actually have ways to say, okay, I want to actually plan, okay, next week I'm going to fly a drone at 8 in the morning when the sun angle is going to be XX. Uh, and I'm going to get this many images in the next half an hour. I'm going to make a very quick ortho mosaic of it, and then I can give it to someone who needs it to actually, you know, figure out. Okay, has there been mangroves? Mangroves have been cut in a particular area. Is there some kind of deforestation? Is there some land use change? Something new coming up? And again, we can use robots for that. So when I say robot operator, yeah, we fly drones. We use drones for mapping intensively, but it's very much a part of our geospatial pipeline. So you know, it's 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 big and fancy on the outside, but for the inside, it's like for us, it's like another way of image acquisition, which complements our satellite imagery and we're also experimenting with balloons and kites which is still experimental but uh yeah we're having fun with that component i was trying to imagine what sort of robot you would be operating so now i get it <laughs> okay um and this i mean i guess this is a question for you shashank but i'd also like to know from david and jessica what they think um what do you see as the tools with the highest sort of untapped potential so we do we are using a lot of the really small drones at this point of time so we're using you know the, the under 250 gram drones right because again like like the different every country has different permissions around them in india the permissions became much more open as of november last year so actually so what we're doing a lot of currently is training people on how to use really small drones to collect environmental intelligence because again like fly, how to fly them legally safely not get in trouble with authorities by complying with all the permissions and the rules so that's currently something we're really trying to tap is the power of very small drones which can which are which are very powerful David or Jessica, do you have uh, thoughts on some a tool that's sort of the most untapped, has the best potential out there? I'm not sure that I would focus on one tool. Um, I think as, as contribution has been thrust into the, one might call it the big data era, um, certainly with the explosion of satellite images um, propelling that uh, in the related data and information derived as, as Global Forest Watch does wonderfully. Um, I think the, um, making making data um, and, and related information products accessible to uh, non-technical audiences is, is probably the, the biggest opportunity um, that would could really uh, broaden application of <clears throat> um, uh, these, these products for uh, to benefit conservation and sustainable development. And um, you know, I, I'm speaking of uh, things like intelligence systems that feature dashboards, data visualizations, some of what Global Forest Watch has. Uh, you know, it, it, it's an incredible platform um, that we were huge fans of and consumers of. Um, and, and these systems uh, you know, enable um, you know, non-technical experts to um, in a harness uh, data streams such as uh, forest loss and global forest loss case uh, to um, address a, a myriad of issues um, related to from monitoring evaluation or 
uh, they can be used to underpin land use planning and scenario development. Um, so we're really, it's a very exciting time to be a spatial geek, if you will. I'll tell you in some. <laughs> from um, our side as a, you know kind of um, as opposed to facilitators and and, and uh, creating delivery mechanisms for for a lot of this information um, the satellite imagery and, and other ins insights derived from satellite data uh, we've been focusing recently as we've heard from uh, users um, they you know most important to them as are out doing uh, field patrols is um, really being able to both um, identify uh, as quickly as possible recent deforestation that's occurred, but also to be able to communicate about that deforestation to others um, from an independent source, because a lot of times, particularly for indigenous and local communities or you know, local civil society organizations, um, instead of just having uh, hearsay, you know, presented as, as like verbal evidence, having both the satellite imagery and then other documentation, drone footage, um, uh, you know, photos and, and videos, um, audio clips, right, right, documenting what's happening. So um, I think as both um, Shashank and David mentioned, right, like pairing that like local knowledge with the global um, satellite based knowledge is, is, is really important. Um, so in our case, we've been focused on uh, in the past few years and um, improving uh, near real time deforestation alerts. Um, so these are algorithms that through machine learning um, analyze and interpret satellite imagery um, to detect um, with like a little pink pixel where um, forest change has happened. So where intact forest uh, became something else um, was cleared and uh, trying to figure out how to improve these systems and then also make them more accessible. Um, so Shashank mentioned um, like optical systems, which is, is what we had, but of course the limitation is when there's a lot of cloud cover or smoke from haze and forest fires, um, then the images, um, even though the um, new images appear on a um, weekly basis as the satellites circle the earth and, and, and take new, new pictures, um, sometimes, you know, weeks or months can go by without being able to detect um, deforestation because of the, you know, cloud cover or um, smoke from haze. Uh, and so um, just last year, um, we released uh, radar based alerts uh, on the global forest watch system. So now we have three different alert systems, um, the optical and, and radar that, that complement that so it could see through um, smoke and haze and then just working on uh, doing our best to improve the delivery mechanisms, both that we develop. Um, we've uh, created a mobile application called Forest Watcher that allows users to be able to download uh, the deforestation alert data and fire alert data, um, access that offline and navigate um, to those uh, alert areas, document what they observe uh, for clearing, and then um, go back and compile that information and share with, with others. Um, but also working with um, partners um, who, you know, may or may not have access even to, to mobile devices. Um, so what are ways that we can create these sort of um, pipeline of getting, you know, the information out to um, folks that are monitoring on the ground? Um, so through, for example, downloading coordinates with the, of the alerts and sending those through WhatsApp or even over um, high frequency radio. Um, or even just printing out the map and taking that uh, into the, the, you know, the area. So I think there's a lot of um, really interesting innovations that are coming out of, um, you know, these examples of, of folks like working on the ground. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're, we're doing our best to try to respond to the needs that, that we hear, um, but also compile and share kind of lessons of what's happening in one place and, and bring that to, to others working on similar issues. Let me just stay with uh, you, Jessica, on this next question is just sort of, I mean, I think everyone knows, well, maybe for the people who don't know, and if you can explain even better, how do you think the data and technology are going to protect forests? And then how is that so important for achieving sort of wider climate goals? Sure. So I think, um, you know, we've seen some 
great early examples of, uh, we've heard anecdotally uh, since Global Force Watch launched in 2014, and you know even before that from other groups that were working with satellite imagery and um, how the satellite imagery uh, and related data uh, enabled folks to be able to um, detect deforestation and, and respond to it to right away. But uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, sort of concrete evidence of the fact that that was actually making a difference in terms of reduction in deforestation uh, until last year when we partnered with Rainforest Foundation US and Orpio, which is an indigenous organization uh, in northern Peru, um, to do a randomized control trial um, where 76 uh, indigenous communities participated, um, half were randomly selected to receive the treatment, which was uh, being equipped with access to um, satellite imagery, the deforestation alerts, um, and then also training on how to use them. Uh, each of the uh, treatment communities um, democratically elected uh, three monitors uh, who did monthly patrols um, with the alerts uh, and then um, compiled that information, uh, submitted that to the authorities, um, and then found at the end of the first year, uh, as compared to the control communities, the uh, groups that were actively involved in the monitoring with satellite-based alerts saw a 52% reduction in deforestation, an additional 21% uh, the following year. So I think there's just enormous potential to be able to, to scale this, um, but really the, you know, the, the need for um, uh, recognition and funding um, for the folks who are doing the field patrols on the ground. I mean, it's a highly uh, cost-effective and, and efficient um, Way to, to monitor with just a little bit of um, influx of uh, you know technology and um, some training on on how to use it, and it, obviously the the potential um, for um, impact is, is is very great. That's a that's a great example. Do you, I mean I love to sense you know because we always talk. It feels when you talk about how to make things you know how to improve the situation. It, it feels so big, broad brush, climate goals things. But when you took it take it more directly and you can say in this example this did this so i guess it's just making sure that those who policymakers and funders are aware of the impact of this and and having getting them to you know move forward and i don't know if either shashank or david have you know similar examples they want to mention just sort of on the broader climate goals and what you're doing and how that can make an impact um i think um in in AWF case, um, one of the ways we're trying to engage uh, climate change is by working um, with partners um, and, and leaders across the continent at uh, in um, at events like COP or um, at tables at the African Union, for example, to elevate um, climate change as an issue. And you know, this gets away from technology. I realize. Um, but uh, to essentially amplify the voices uh, that are, are speaking to climate change and, and uh, the need for human adaptation, especially recognizing that Africa is perhaps the most vulnerable continent uh, to climate change, um, both in terms of its people and, and in many, many respects, uh, the wildlife population they live with. Um, on, a, on a more, uh, uh, on, a, on the, as a landscape scale, which we primarily operate on the ground, uh, climate change figures in um, largely uh, through and technology. And I think they intersect uh, largely in the sense of land use planning, where you can try to prioritize areas using uh, satellite image derived land use land cover and other characterizations of um, things like ecosystem service delivery areas uh, for water provisioning and, and carbon mitigation to find those win-win areas that where you have um, a you know, high value um, carbon and, and water provisioning areas and combined with uh, uh, conservation values as well. And so we can target our efforts uh, towards a more um, climate resilient landscape for both the people and the wildlife. Shashank, did you want to add on that one? Yeah, sure. I'll just add briefly. So we're doing a lot of work with mangroves uh, along the coastline. And again, like they're really important for uh, 
that in like against climate change security right like we're looking at like carbon sequestration water services uh filtration air and water quality improvement as well uh and again satellite imagery is really is, is great to actually map out these mangroves identify they with where they are look at deforestation alerts for this kind of thing right because again the, uh, in, at least in india mangroves are protected so any mangrove destruction is uh, illegal so we can actually use again deforestation alerts but then we can also do drone overflights uh, things like that uh, which get passed on to communities who can then use it, uh, you know, maybe not like in uh, the, in courts because that might take too long and by the time anything happens, uh, the mangroves might already be gone, but more for like local activism, for engagement with government officials who, again, have a responsibility and a desire to actually prevent uh, deforestation. Uh, so actually to help people like that get access to this kind of information is, is, is crucial. For us, like the impactful component here is to have really fast turnaround times. Um, but if people want um, information, they can get it quickly. And uh, again, which is why we push them towards platforms like Global Forest Watch, uh, again, and Google Earth, anything they can use for the data, and also help them in whatever way we can with training and with access to satellite imagery, to maps as well. So I think that's the that's the that's the way to go forward, which is really empowering local communities uh, at as decentralized a level as possible with information they can use uh, for themselves. I think that I mean it sounds you know as always as a situation right empowering the local communities is super important. But how how do you get these cutting edge tools? How do you make sure that the innovations are accessible, especially for for groups in low or or middle income countries? I mean, who maybe, you know, they may be struggling just to get a good phone phone line. So I don't know how, how do we, how do you do that? So one thing we're, we've been doing specifically is because again, with the, as we're a foundation, we've been talking to our donors and we've been getting funding so we can provide again, our services as it were for free to anyone who needs them. So what we're doing is we're assessing people who are the requirements, what the impact of our intervention is going to be, um, and then actually being able to help them without any, uh, you know, in, without any need for them to reciprocate, reciprocate, to actually pay anything, because that's, I think that's one of the biggest barriers, as you mentioned, we have, we've been facing is that, okay, all the partners we want to work with the foundation have no money, uh, and that's just the way it's going to be, we're not expecting them to be, be like really well off and then trying to work in conservation at the, you know, at the level they're working at. So that's again our model, which is again, like they have lots of, there are lots of free services out there. There is lots of free imagery and data out there. We've got lots of grants in place to actually have access to software, which can use it. We use lots of open source software as well. So again, I think one thing to really like emphasize on her is that open source data is great, but the open source software to actually use it is equally essential. So for example, for drone mapping work, we use something called uh, web open drone map. Uh, for GIS work, we have QGIS. We also have, again, uh, grants from SRI under their conservation program to actually use ArcGIS and drone to map. But again, we have this balance between proprietary expensive software and free open source software. So when we train people, we do it on the free open source software because that's what's <coughs> accessible to them and then we can use a mix for us when we're doing our professional level work but at the community level again we, we can give them free maps and free training and there's free data out there free resources so far so we're very much building those bridges between what people need on the ground and the resources which again people with lots of goodwill have made available globally i guess the the big challenge there is making sure people know it's available um which i'm sure everyone is working towards um we actually are almost running out of time. So I just wanna, I would like to do uh, a quick question to each of you just on what what can people who are listening now, what can be done now um, just to make it better and easier and faster for these sorts of tools to have an impact in conservation efforts? Um, Jessica, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I think Funding is, is really the, the big issue. Um, I think you know organizations like WRI and others are committed to continue to providing open source software in an uh, accessible format. Um, but really, we need to funnel money uh, to the folks who are working on the front lines of combating deforestation. Um, in the study that I mentioned, um, it's incredibly cost effective. It was like six dollars a hectare a year um, to to achieve those reductions in deforestation. Um, and we saw with the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use, um, huge financial commitments um, were 19 billion total, but 1.7 billion of that uh, is um, supposed to um, be funneled directly to help indigenous and local communities to exercise decision-making 
uh, and design roles in, in climate programs. Um, so we need to make sure that this climate finance, like one of the pledges um, that actually go through and two, that that money is actually reaching the folks on the, the front lines who are, um, who are you know, faced with um, uh, both, you know, halting deforestation, but also whose lives are most directly Im impacted by it. Yeah, a good challenge, a big challenge. David, what would you say? Yes, um, I think, um, yeah, funding is certainly essential. Um, I think when, in terms of um, developing these emerging tools, um, keep a laser-like focus on the end user needs and capacities so that they are well-designed to suit uh, their capabilities and their ambitions um, and, and design these tools with um, integration and evolution in mind. Um, and I also note that some of the most successful tools, um, they, they build a, a strong, vibrant community of practice around the, the toolkit uh, to, to support uh, user uh, application. And, and and also propel the evolution of the tools uh, because technology, as we all know, is changing fast and the tools have to keep pace. Yeah, exactly. Can we ever keep pace with the te technology? Shashank, a uh, quick answer from yes, you? Sure. I think that it's just about making it like evident that technology only amplifies human intent and capacity. Again, that's something that uh, Kentaro Toyama, that's one of his like signature quotes. And just keep that in mind that, again, like we have to really focus on the intent and capacity and the tech is just a way to get there. So again, we're not technology evangelists, but it's just the means to an end and the end is conservation. Uh, that is a perfect way to a note to end on. I think this has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, there's so much I didn't know walking coming into this and uh, I feel I slightly have a little bit more knowledge and hopefully everyone watching does as does too. Um, we've had a great event with um, you know all the input from all of our different speakers and thank you to Gillian Caldwell as well. And I would I would just like to thank um, everybody for coming. Thank you all, David. Jessica and Shashank for your insights and um, especially like to thank our partner, the Satellite Applications Catapult, uh, for helping us to present this event. And let's just see how things go as we work towards um, our the climate goals. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.